that student's on full financial aid and Pell Grant. Um, and that causes some issues with our donors as well. So we want to make sure the need gets to where it's meant. So we ask more questions to find that out. Um, the difference is we don't do the simplified needs test. We know that we have a lot of business owners who have negative adjusted gross in incomes. They show businesses with losses, but they actually have quite a bit of money. You look at what the cash balance is in their business and they have millions. Um, so we don't auto zero anyway, just for, for that. Um, we look at assets for the students uh, and the parents, but we consider the students' assets a parent. We share that with them. Um, we expect minimum contributions regardless of financial need. Now these actually vary by school. So some schools may have these. We actually have different numbers at Duke. Um, but even for a family who we say has no ability to contribute whatsoever, there is a minimum contribution from a student that roughly equals um, our budget in cost of attendance for miscellaneous. They're usually pretty close. Um, we cover things that are billed and we cover books usually with our, our grant aid. And then um, the student contribution piece is um, usually what we built in for their spending money. We do expect a student to contribute that portion. We let them know and put it in our cost of attendance, hey, you should bring money to school. You're going to need it when you get here because you're going to have expenses. We don't put institutional aid there. So that's a lot of times why that minimum student contribution exists. Um, I talked about the number of students in college and why we don't use 50%. We don't just divide it by the number of students. We use 45%. We multiply contribution by 45%. You get three in school. So it gets even a little bit harder. Um, we assess student income a little bit more heavily than the federal formula does. We pretty much assume if the student has earnings that should be available to use for college. And the same thing with assets. Uh, we have a fairly harsh assessment. <laughs> Um, we also have these bands, so depending on where your income falls, it's just like taxes. So the more money you make, the higher basically we tax it for the purpose of college. So families in our upper income brackets would probably, for every additional dollar they make, and that'd be 45 or 46 percent of every additional dollar toward college. Whereas our families in our lowest income brackets, we're protecting them, might only be paying 22 percent, just like your taxes work. Is everybody familiar with that concept? That's how we assess it. Um, we protect for savings. Um, we do the same thing. We have different formulas for how we come up with things. Uh, ours is based on the consumer expenditure survey every year, which asks what are the most common things that Americans buy and how much do they pay for those things. So, if you're ever, so instead of using like this preset 1960 whatever market basket, we actually say what are they spending money on and how much does it cost. And so, what you will find, just in general, families who, let's say, apply to Duke and then apply to a school that only uses the FAFSA, that have relatively low income, will get more money at Duke. We'll say that their need is higher than the federal methodology will say. And that's because we're protecting for different items and in greater amounts because we think people spend more money than what the FAFSA does, the amount that we're protecting tends to be greater under institutional methodology. The reverse is true in the upper income brackets because of the way that we look at assets, and we'll talk about that in a second. But for needy students, a needy student who applies and has an EFC at a school using FM and who applies to Duke will get more money at Duke because we'll say their need is greater, almost always in the low income brackets. But we consider different assets. Um, one of the things, um, I'm not sure which slide it's on. One of the things we look at is uh, home equity. So FAFSA ignores home equity, we consider it. And so that's part of what goes into a family. Because if you've got a home paid off in a different financial position than the family can design. Some of the, the things about it is, do you think that's fair to look at a person's home? Just out of curiosity. You think so? 
of schools that use institutional methodology that also think that's, we, you need to consider it, but to an extent. And so the majority of schools who use institutional methodology actually cap how much they'll use in relation to a person's income. Duke, for instance, uses 1.2 times a person's income is the most home equity you would ever consider. Because you've got those families who inherited something and then it grew in value, they don't have that money to spend, and it's the family house, they're not going to sell it, and it doesn't seem right to borrow against it because they can't really afford to borrow against it. They couldn't pay the bill if they did. They just inherited something or sitting. So for that family, you want to make sure that we're somewhat lenient. However, what about somebody who chose not to buy a home and just rent and kept all that money in savings? We're protecting that family that owned the home then. So we, the methodology conversations around it are pretty interesting, but if you ever wonder why we do what we do, a lot of it has to do with these institutional methodology conversations. That's where Financial League started. And then FM kind of streamlined it for the masses. Um, but when you see changes, a lot of the changes that are taking place in, in federal methodology are part of these kinds of discussions you're going to step there. Should we consider one equity? There might be a day when FM does, who knows? Um, but it's all things to think about. So if you want to know why students are confused, if they apply to multiple schools, especially if one's an IM school, it's because we're all looking at different stuff. And I guess the school makes the choice about creating the institutional methodology. They make their own formula. No, so institutional methodology is a standardized, somewhat standardized formula. It's um, put together by the college board. And so the reason I can't share with you and like do a hand count to show you the difference between institutional methodology and federal methodology is the college board owns institutional methodology formula. So the people that make the SAT, they make the application for financial aid at a place like Duke or Elon, or Harvard or Princeton or e Emory or Vanderbilt. Um, they use the CSS profile that's owned by the college board. They do their own statistical research on, for instance, they, uh, institutional methodology provides allowances depending on where you live in the country. They know it's more expensive to live in New York than it is in Texas. And they know it's more expensive to live in a zip code in New York than it is to live in a certain zip code in Texas. And so it's really granular, and they do all that research, and so those tables are proprietary. Um, but it gives us a much more precise sense of what a family can afford. And so they own it. Everybody uses that same set of um, tables that the college board owns. And then we make our own institutional decisions about it, for instance, that we're not going to assess all the home tax. We're going to look at that family circumstance and, and decide whether or not that's a fair thing to do. If it's the, if it's the family barn or something like that, we don't want to penalize that particular family. Whereas if we saw that they bought the home in 2013 and they paid cash <coughs> and mortgage on it, it's worth $800,000, and you know they live in Kinston, we're going to take a look at that and say, where'd they get $800,000 cash? I think we are going to use that one. Do you know what I mean? And so you make more decisions like that. Um, you can't do that with facts and data. And that's why we use it. The average student who's, who's funded at Duke, um, if they don't, if they have high need, we're probably spending $58,000 in institutional grant aid on that student. And so before you invest that much of a donor's money, you want to make sure that it's, it's well spent for the student who really needs it. Um, we would like to be that vigilant with taxpayer money, but balancing it with access is tricky. And so we, that's why you see the fast asking fewer questions. Any questions about that or why it's used or how it's used? You ready to do some math? Uh, before we do, I'm going to explain what's